Be a cowboy, same one, take one. I don't know. Ra would have had this all worked out before we even started. Aye, he always did. It's a very curious story, this idea that men working in a factory would decide to chip in a bit of money and then go off into the quarry and, and act as cowboys or Indians. We all had boring, mundane jobs, and it was driving us close to insanity, and we come upon the idea of making these films. Right, roll it. Most work at the Falkirk British Aluminium Plant, so they call themselves the BA Cowboys. In the early days, I thought they were nutters, <laughs> but even contemplating doing it. It's really interesting to see men working in the heavy industry, ultimately in the 1970s in, in central part of Scotland having this real creative output. Did they hang on to the tomahawk or they get a let it drop? She did them back to the shop. If Rab was still alive and were to make another film, it would definitely be another Western because that was his forte. I think there's that it's kind of working class thing. You're in a group, you're in a crowd, uh, you were a posse, and that was part of the ethos of being that kind of guy. They were very serious about it. I think they thought they were really fully blown actors. If I'm too quick for you, I'll date again. These films are unique. They were putting their heart and soul into it to make something that had artistic merit. We were there to enjoy ourselves. We were there to make a film, but at the same time have fun. And we did. We did to the extreme. These films could have been lost forever. Robbie Harvey is a truck driver during the week. On this set, he's a king of the silver screen. The B.E. Cowboys really began in July 1970, when I decided to have a go at a homemade Western, with a simple script and some basic cowboy gear, such as gun, holsters and cowboy-style hats. We set the cameras rolling on an eight-minute epic called Lawless Breed. Rob had all the script. He directed us, told us what to do. Well, Rab Harvey, it was his idea. Rab then came to me, and I liked the idea. I said, OK. My name's Dennis McCourney. I work for British Aluminium Company, Falkirk. He said, we'll need to get other, others. I says, don't worry about that. I'll soon deal with that way. <laughs> so I got other guys to come. Dennis would talk to anybody into anything. Alec Penman from Plain Stirling, Scotland. Dennis would say, I've got the very thing for you, lad. Come with me, we've got the films to make. And we went, right, aye, OK, fine, aye, that's fine. I'm Ian Gardner, and I worked in the BA, the British Aluminium. I started there in 1968, and I finished in 1976. Tomorrow morning, Dennis and the rest of the lads will be back on the factory floor. But they'll be thinking about the next time, when they can ride that range once more. Well, Volker, I would describe it as being very much a working man's town. Volker was a great shopping centre. They had dance halls, they had picture houses, they had an ice rink. It was a great social place, Falkirk. And there were plenty of employment for everybody that had foundries, the, well, the aluminium. So it was quite a prosperous place, yeah. you could say. Nice place to work in. 
The people of Falkirk are known as men of metal because they've had you know, almost 250 years really of working uh, with, uh, first of all, iron uh, and then aluminium. In 1943, the British government realised that they needed to increase their supply of sheet aluminium and they looked to Scotland for this new centre. The BA factory produced aluminium sheeting. They had the rolling mills and the finishing department. The rolling mills took it down for a massive block and then into a long coil, a massive coil. For aluminium, is by nature a lightweight champion among metals. Quick, nimble, versatile, ready to adopt a thousand shapes, but never losing its essential qualities of strength and lightness. It was feedstock for almost everything that was made in Britain. It was used in, in Queen Elizabeth II, for example. Fridges, airplanes, buses, cars, you name it. We made metal for the Concorde, the greatest plane in the world. And if you think that it employed over 2,500 people at its peak and that the population of the main town itself was in the region of 20,000 at that time, that's quite an important, significant portion. When I left school, actually, uh, th there was, it was still quite common to be recruited just directly from school. It was a family place. Fathers, sons, cousins, uncles. If you're a boy, you went into factory. If you're a girl, you went into the office. And your father actually attended the interviews. And that was really it. All the movie makers work here and first started making films as an escape from the routine of factory life. If you were at 62 shift at 2 o'clock, your day was finished. And then you went home. Although some of us wanted to do more. Rab was, uh, he was, he was unique. He had a fascination for the cowboy films. I've got this idea, boys. I'd been thinking about it for about 20 years. But what gave me the final push was a TV Western serial about a saloon girl's pet poodle. They wasted 15 minutes of film and all that lovely gear we could badly do with showing a so-called cowboy chasing that pet poodle. You don't need a flaming six-shooter to do that. It was Rob Harvey, it was Dennis and Jock who decided, let's make film. We went away for our, our days after we finished work, just went straight to wherever we were filming. And there we went and made cowboy films. Something different, yeah, it's different. Sitting in front of a telly or we playing darts and a pint of beer. It was, it was a whole different existence. Apache Ambush, 67, take eight. Ram Harvey was, he'd done the direction, but J Joe Keegan, he was a cameraman. Hey, Joke's camera. It's his camera. He, he had it. I think he must have used it for going on holiday and things like that. Cameras like, like these, um, this Japanese-made 8mm camera, were very popular. Between the 1930s and the 1960s, there was a really strong amateur film scene in the United Kingdom. But when you look at Scottish film history through the lens of the collections that we hold at the National Library, what you see is a very strong, creative filmmaking practice that is, exists in the amateur world. Typically, an amateur filmmaker would start by making a home movie. They would take up the camera so that they could film the new baby, or maybe they'd move to a new house and they wanted to film their garden. Um, after that, they might take the camera on holiday, they might make short documentaries. But then there was another type of amateur filmmaking, which is more unusual. I was quite excited when I heard about these films because they're really unusual, certainly in terms of our collections. We have virtually no cowboy genre films in our collections. I've never seen that with Alec. I've not seen him for a lot of years. Dennis as well, so it'll be great to catch up. 
So I think it'll be a really good catch-up to get see them up and see how everything's doing. Well, this is Forbes the Calendar Estate House in Falkirk. And I'm here to meet my cowboy friends who used to make the films with. I'm getting a wee bit anxious about their arrival. I'm looking all over the place, looking for them. So I hope they'll be here soon. I'm hoping to have a chat with them regarding what we've done in the past and how much we enjoyed it. So I hope they'll have the same frame of mind as I am. Hello, oh, Alec. How you doing? How are you getting on, pal? Oh, great. So nice to see you. I've never seen you for a while. No, good. Brother. How are you getting on? How about Big Ian? Fine, I'm great. It's nice to see you. How about Ian? Is he coming? Who's that old man <laughs> that's with you? <laughs> God's sake. Who are you talking about? <laughs> How are you doing? Eh? Good to see you again. White hair, do you? Eh? Look How at you. How you doing? It's nice blonde. It's nice to see you. So uh, there's nobody else coming in, I take it? What the neck? No, to my knowledge. We're maybe the only three left. <laughs> we're, not, we're not far away. Okay. We're, we're becoming a rare breed. Anyway, let's anyway. go inside. Uh, eh? OK, we'll, ju we'll just go in. And, we'll go inside. And we'll go in and, and enjoy the company, yeah? See what we can catch. <laughs> <laughs> Calendar House is a lovely old stately home in Calendar Park, and it was owned by the Forbes family. And this is where the archives are held. Well, here we look at this stuff, boys. There you go. Right. Wonder what look at these films, Dennis. This is highly technical. Right, OK. Keep on going there and look down. And I'm some sort gentleman. I haven't got one for me. We'll try this one. Who's... Who was that? Yeah. Oh, so I can make that one out. That's my good self in the white one. Oh. oh, I can make that one out. You I can have a look at that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's a handsome Indian, isn't he? Dennis, you'll love that, Ian. When you took the horse down to the BA gates and all the women were there, you have a look in there. We hold a wide variety of material. Uh, it all falls under the remit of if it's got something to do with the people of Falkirk, the businesses of Falkirk, or any clubs or organisations. There we go with the start of our club. Dear Cowboy Pals, thanks for coming to the party to shoot. So they put on a shooting, a shooting display for them and then showed them the films. So that would be Danny Lovely. putting his guns on. Yeah. The films were good. You're great. Love, Tony. Oh, right. that's nice. Nice. Brilliant. That's really nice. Uh, uh, nice. And it's coming for kids. That's yeah. coming for kids. And so that in the speaks volumes of what we've done. Oh, right. Right. Oh, that makes it all worthwhile. Yeah, that's it. Players that's like what that. it was all about, was Aye. the youngsters enjoying themselves along with us. <laughs> but after all Aye. the years, it's so easy to forget that. Aye. Well, love, the last time I saw the films, a long time ago. I think I think that they've kind of went adrift. I think. It's been a lot of years, like you know, a lot of years. When I started, I just heard stories of these very peculiar films that are stored somewhere in the building, and I was told there was a, a cupboard with special material. And after when I finally found this couple of special material, it was downstairs and behind just all the other archives, hidden in the corner. Watch what happens you put a camera at him. Look at that. Look at him. The star looking at the camera. Aye. And look. I'm no posing. Look, look at that. No, look at that. He's no not conscious. Eh? Look, look at this. Is my hair okay? Look at all of this. Nothing. <laughs> right, those things. I've got this box for you. Um, and it is all your old films, which I've actually. All the old films? Aye. Is that the old film? Aye. What's that way in the door? Aye. So, right. I've set up a projector next door for you, so when you're ready, you can just pop through and have a wee watch them, right? Oh, that's great. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, very much. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. That's brilliant. Well, the box triggers my memory. But our cameraman, Jock Aitken, told me many years ago that he handed these films in here to the museum. And I've never given it another thought until now to they just reappeared in front of me. But it was nice, it was nice and very thoughtful to Jock to do that because these films could have been lost forever. 
That's a change to see classy, oh, classy movies. Mordor Bad Men was a simple story of a sheriff and his deputy tracking down three bad men. With the finale in the desert wastelands of Arizona. These films are made in the early 70s, but they're not the revisionist westerns that were emerging at that time. This is not Sam Peckinpah's kind of moody, morally ambiguous Old West. We made this film in one day, in two different areas. In these days, cowboys and Indians were the thing that everybody got involved in when they were young playing it in uh, the school and in the school playgrounds uh, around the streets. This, this cinema was a regal. That was a regal. A regal cinema. See, that was bad. a great cinema. Great. Back to every week. Volker had five cinemas. Cinema was pretty much the main leisure-going activity for people, and it was affordable as well. That was the days when an empty jam jar got you into the pictures. A jam jar? In the new days, they had what was called children's matinees. So the matinees were on on a Saturday morning. So we would go as, as kids there. And, uh, and that sort of introduced you to film life. Remember with the cinema, what was the song for the boys? We are the boys and girls well known as miners of the ABC. Yes, and every Saturday we, we line, line up. And every Saturday all line up. And I don't remember the rest of the words. To shout aloud with glee. It took you back to when you were a schoolboy playing cowboys and Indians. This was becoming a reality. You were going to get filmed doing it. I think there's uh, cowboys. Small boy in all of us, really. Most men in particular rather fancy themselves as the cowboy, you know. Well, paying homage to what they clearly enjoyed as when they were younger. Seeing my dad in, in company with his pals, there was a side of his character there that we, which we didn't really get in the home. I was reliving their childhood. <laughs> They'd hate me for saying that, but I'm quite sure that's what it was. And also Dennis could ride, which uh, was a definite advantage. I've always had a love of horses, and I introduced my daughter, Denise, to the horses, and it's went again to the next generation, uh, to Vicky. Um, lots of really nice memories, and Dad doing loads, always been busy, totally. Like, if he wasn't early shift, he was back shift. If he wasn't back shift, he was doing something with the BA Cowboys, and it went on to more fundraising and stuff for loads of different causes, and he was an absolute trooper. The BA Cowboys is responsible for Denise taking the lovely horses and then passing it on to her daughters. There's no, there's no if and button about that. I don't think so. I mean, we've got to turn this into a real John Wayne special. So this is John Wayne in The Man from Utah. And John Wayne was really the quintessential cowboy. And I think that comes across very strongly in these films, uh, particularly in the images of the cowboys on horseback. They're shot from low down. It's what we might term a heroic angle. John Wayne's presence comes through strongly in that. Well, I think uh, when, when Rab had maybe got me, I did want me as John Wayne. I, uh, if I, <laughs> I was just too good to be a baddie. I'd like to play like the Audie Murphy type style because uh, 
he and I are similar in height and weight. I guess you're right. Audie Murphy was about my height and weight, and he, as all Western fans will well know, he did die last year. And I've been waiting patiently for maybe I'll get the offer. <laughs> in retrospect, things that you know you would have to go to film school to learn new, or about narrative technique. They knew all that because they were going to the movies twice a week. Early on in the film, you get a shot, reverse shot, where the cowboy is looking straight at the camera and he points the gun at the camera. And I thought, that is pure Edison. That is Thomas Edison's 1903 film of the Great Train Robbery. Um, you get that scene at the end. It's iconic. And I thought that was a very sort of powerful evocation of the genre. The next feature we introduced to our films was the cowboy's dreaded enemy, the Indian. Hence the title of the next film, Apache Ambush. Apache Ambush, it's me being the Indian. I love this film. They're all packing these guns. Somebody reported seeing men walking around with guns in the park when they must have been filming, and they rang the police, and the police said, oh, that's OK, that'll be the BA Cowboys. And then they looked and went, BA Cowboys. Ah. My firearm consisted of uh, a stock of a shotgun, two bits of tube held on with black tape, and they said, you're not going to do much damage oh, with that. The best way to describe the story is a bloody battle between white man and Indian. The film runs for about 10 minutes. It is action-packed and contains some scenes of a fairly good standard. Oh, there we go. Oh. It's a long while since I've seen this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, my God. Do you like being a cowboy best, or do you occasionally like to be an Indian? Love, love being an Indian. There was a lot of people who wanted to be cowboys. I wanted to be different. The native people who were referred to as Indians were characterised as at home in the wilderness. Cheyenne, Apache, Blackfoot, Sioux, they're vicious killers, all of them, they ain't even human. Their Indian is of the kind that you might see in a television serial. It's simplified for child's view. What we have is the vision of an enthusiast of that genre. They were often feminised characters in stark contrast to the, the quite um, hard masculinity of the gunslinger. Was that your own hair, Alec? Uh, <laughs> no. Are you sure? Positive. The hair was a wig. I never ever had long hair. It was just cast off a pair of jeans with some frills on the side. Bare chest, wee waistcoat. Thanks very much. You were an Indian with long hair. Tomahawk. Ah. Yeah, that, see that tomahawk? In here, pride of place, one tomahawk. The lads pay for their film by subscribing 15p a week each. Everything's done on the cheap. The Indian's war lance was once a broom handle. The gun belts started life as handbags. The, the school bags had a lovely flat panel in the back. So, perfect size for making the holsters. He used my sister's school bag and they, a, a couple of handbags. No, maybe just for myself, but for anybody. She, <laughs> she had, was finished with her school bag, so he used her. It was a briefcase. He used that. That's the panel you're left with. You lay the gun on it, and the gun will sit there. So you draw a line further out. These bullets. The, the bullets are brass casings that I got made specially by the turners in the factory, then just tipped with lead to look the part. Fold it over, you've got your holster. Now, I used bifurcated rivets, which is a rivet split down the middle. Full marks must be given to the wives of my workmates for this production. They supplied wigs, Colourful homemade jackets and so on. My auntie was a really good seamstress, and I remember Auntie Lily, who was my mum's sister, doing loads of stuff. And there's all the rivets right down there, and you've got that. And that's how easy it is to make a holster or pay twenty pound out of shop. And uh, when my wife's handbags went missing, 
it cost me more than £20 to replace them. <laughs> <laughs> when you're filming for 10, 15 feet away, looks the part, you wouldn't know. And you've saved all that money. And you can always take pleasure in saying, well, I made that. I keep noticing that the lads keep changing. He's, he's an Indian now, you know he's going to be a cowboy. Why is all that? Oh, you see in this unit, <laughs> <laughs> the economy's a thing, you see. You're a bit short uh, of clothes, are you? A bit short, short of clothes. And uh, <laughs> clothes on, on, some like days we're short of actors, too, you see. And it's got to be like the real Hollywood stuff. Some men have got to play as much as five parts in the same picture. In fact, I can recollect one man being killed six times in a one picture, but you wouldn't <laughs> know it was him. <laughs> You've got a few more problems with Alfred Hitchcock, haven't you? I have that, <laughs> definitely. Hitchcock's problems are mild compared to yours. The best we could do with the equipment we had. Aye. I must have been a goodie, I've got a white hat on. Whoa, oh, right. Whoa. <laughs> oh, that's it, you're away. Whoa. You're a goner, yeah. now. We had a fight scene in the barn, and we didn't have the luxury, time or desire to put weighted down rubber mats and make sure there were no sharp glass and no sharp stones. We just go on there. There was no insurance in these days. If you got hurt, you got hurt. Somebody got a wee extra punch. It was just all right. You can maybe get you back later on. In my opinion. Apache Ambush could be called a minor classic. This is Falkirk in Scotland. And this is a typical Falkirk pub. Now, I've had a pretty hard time of it lately, and I think I need a bit of time off. And it's the weekend, so I'm going to treat myself to a nice, relaxing drink. Seems quiet enough. We went on BBC, and it was a, it was a big thing. Well, hello, honey. And I thought, oh, we're really making the big time. A lot of people come up and went, seen you on the telly. My chest did puff out. Uh, uh, just that scene, that's my husband. What are you doing while our phone's set here? Come on, get off. I came in for a drink. I made day off. <laughs> Bernard Falk was really good, and he became interested in what we were doing. Of course, the nice thing about this mob is that uh, anyone can be a star with them. He changed his opinion in Scotland. <laughs> he came up, he came up to the BBC <laughs> expecting to see Tuchters. <laughs> and he didn't see Tuchters. He was feeling pretty. He, he was. wanted to take part in the film. He, he was dead. We tied him in a tree <laughs> and left him. And I remember we were all sitting on a neighbour's couch waiting for my dad to come on and he'd done his hey, quick draw and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> come on then, let's have a look. If I'm too quick for you, I'll date again. OK? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <dear>. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the horse coming out of the garage. Dennis, caught here in an informal pose, is setting off on location with his trusty steed, Perry, from his home on the Stenhouse Muir estate. As before, this five foot four inch son of a gun will fight off the bad men and redskins before he gets the girl and rides off into the sunset. It's not everybody arrives at their work on a horse. So the guys finishing their shift at two o'clock, they were hanging around saying, I'm not going home, just eat Dennis on this horse. And the guys that were to go in at two o'clock to work to 10 o'clock at night, they were saying, I'm not going in yet. So that, therefore, there was a group of people at the gate, so they were quite interested in seeing this, and, which was nice, it was quite pleasant to do. Dennis was a very good front man for it, and when the time came that he was interviewed, he was excellent. If you were putting a man quite unwittingly to the test by merely setting on the table, say, six hats of various types and descriptions, he'll inevitably, and without any doubt whatsoever, 
he'll pick up the cowboy hat. We're putting a show for uh, old age pensioners, putting a show and let them see the films. Until The Exorcist hits Falkirk, this will be the longest queue in town. You see, all the lads, six westerns, have been box office hits, and that's not surprising because they never charge anything for an audience to see them. Well, when Rob knew it was going and onto television and everything, he was over the moon with it because I think his dream was realised then. He was the proudest punch that his, what had started off as a wee hobby had sort of become really quite a, a big entertainment thing for folk. I could see a progression in the work as well. Our next production was Showdown and runs for 21 minutes. Barn, backed up by a bunch of hired guns who are terrorising local ranchers. And it's the development of the film, the editing, the cutting and splicing, and even the way they're doing sound effects and overdubs it was a lot more labour intensive. <laughs> there is a strong directorial voice there, um, and that is Rab Harvey's voice. He uses his own voice as a voiceover to lead you through the action. Roman Tiger and his sons own a spread north of Silver City, mainly grazing land. Kincaid knows the land is rich in mineral deposits but old man Desert won't sell. You get a sense of a real collective endeavour to create something that is a story. And it's not only because of the voiceover that goes throughout the film that, that kind of structures the narrative, but it's because of the performances as well. You can get a sense of the actors really performing for their director. The film also introduces another authentic bit of the Old West, the saloon girls. And it's the first time that they're creating scenes inside as well. It would have been necessary for them to think about lighting for the first time, having always shot things outside, and now they had to go inside and think about the lighting. Uh, that was all right, Robert, but I'd like to take it again. There's a light showing up in the right-hand corner up there. There's a light showing up in the right-hand corner up there. Light that in itself is quite significant. It's quite a, a, a kind of move forward. And in Showdown, you get a really strong sense of community in the film as well. You have women appearing in the film, um, and they are enjoying their socks off. I think it was between 16 and 17 when we started shooting. And my father didn't really want me to have any part of it. He certainly didn't want to see me on a screen smoking. So I had a fake cigarette in the holder and wasn't really allowed in the pub. But when we went in, the place was closed. So that's how we got away with it. Danny Griffiths, who plays the cattle baron, whose name is Rank Bajan, found us three gorgeous women tailor-made for the parts. They turned the Victoria Bar into the Last Chance Saloon. I was quite happy to do it, and Dennis liked the idea that we were sort of family, and uh, he looked after me, as did all the men. They were lovely. This is the pub, boys. OK. That's the old Vic. The old Vic. That's the Victoria Bar. Thank you, Mr. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Big changes here, boys. Big changes here. Just like a normal Friday night, but it so happened the camera crew turned up and just filmed it. That was the only difference. But that was the only difference. That was just by accident. Somebody leads you low, big man. There's the ladies. You're losing your title. That's what happens in rough pubs. Even the woman battered you. <laughs> Highlights of the film, a saloon brawl and a hanging scene. Oh, it's a hanging job. Oh, this is the hanging, yeah. This I like, is the, I I like, like the hanging bit. Aye. But we just needed a tree with a nice bit of clearance and a branch that came straight out. So the first one we found like it, that's the tree, that's the hanging tree. And that's how we picked it.
So they used the, the special effect um, to show, show this hanging. The harness nut was a good idea, wasn't it? Aye, but he wanted to be sure because he had a bail on the back of his neck. <laughs> <laughs> Much credit goes to Ian Gardner, who designed a special harness for the occasion. The harness was made out of uh, seat belts. <laughs> seat belts. So he's hanging for there. The noose goes round his neck, looks apart. Held on with a bit of black thread. Anything going wrong, sewn thread breaks. I mean, you can see the wire at the back, um, but it's, it's really ambitious stuff and quite dark. It's not personal, what, eh? You've got to go. So whereas the other ones, it was more the Westerns of the, the John Wayne era, I think here we are getting a sense, perhaps, of being influenced by the revisionist Westerns, by the cinema of people like Sam Peckinpah that kind of darker underbelly um, emerges. Everybody turned up that day for the hanging, eh? Oh, everybody. I liked that. Uh, I it was a full house. <laughs> but also the connection to High Noon. We've got a, a shot that's um, from above, which is a little bit evocative of that end shot um, where you have Marshall Kane on his own in the town. Everyone's abandoned him. So I wonder if that's a direct reference to High Noon. Really quite an ambitious piece of work. And by this time, the wives were proud because the husbands, their husbands were so a uh, doing the films for charity. The films are mainly shown to old age pensioners or at kiddies' parties. We raised cash for five born to the operated wheelchairs for spina bifida the children, which was a great thing to be involved in. I do think what they did was admirable because they did raise all that money, but I think they got a lot of support because of that. And although people poo pooed the idea towards the end, there were so many people wanting to be a BA cowboy that we were inundated. So that's why I think the films carried on. <laughs> I think there was, too, there was so many people wanting to be a part of it, knowing how much fun it was and, and the benefit to the community. My first, in fact, probably, probably Ian, my, my only memory of um, being on set was um, when they made a movie called The Mummy's Hand. <laughs> The Mummy's Hand, oh my. <laughs> the Mummy's Hand is a really impressive piece of work. Set in the lone and level uh, sands of Egypt. No. Oh. The first scene in the quarry where the guy's going up over the skyline, uh, the priest, I remember that distinctly. You know, I thought, yeah, I remember thinking at the time, that's got, this is going to look great. Ian was an absolute star as the Mummy. He was a, he, that was his film, that was... Nobody else could take that film off of you, and he was absolutely brilliant. The experience was starting to tell, yeah, they were, they were, uh, they were getting more ambitious. It was a sort of, could we go another step and change direction? Again, Rab's idea to have a go at something else. And uh, I think it was a success. So what they've done is they've taken the sound from the original film and put it onto their own version. Who shall defile the temples of the ancient gods? A cruel and violent death shall be his fate, and never shall his soul find rest. It gives the audience a sense of a film that has higher production values than it actually does have. Rab had a lot of knowledge about film and editing. 
that shot of them, of the guy walking at the camera and then walking away, it was a Rab Harvey signature. I want you to see this. What do you think that is? It's my dad in the red and white striped headdress. Oh, oh he's did again. Oh, Rocky. Oh. You can't have killed Rocky. Got his finger off. I just wanted a ring, no, he's fine. <laughs> And I remember him telling me how he cut the guy's finger off to get his ring. I was absolutely gobsmacked to see my dad do that on film. One of the guys in the film, regrettably, had lost a finger as a young man in the sawmills. Oh. And then you seen the blood all over the place and the gap where his finger no longer was. So that went down quite well, I think. Just, that's, 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 that looks amazing. I was just at the back of Falkirk Golf Club doing the, doing the Stirling Road. It's, it, and it looks like, you know, it looks like, you know, Mecca's just over the top of the hill there. It's absolutely amazing. Ian, we're going up to where we think the, the quarry was at, the, at that time. You'll probably see a difference <laughs> in it. Mm -hmm. Well, when you think you're talking about 48-ish, 48 years or roughly, it's a, it's a, a long time. The ring changes in 48 years. Oh, good, aye. Loads of things change. <laughs> Even us. <laughs> right, Ian. Oh, right, are you going to... Oh. This is where you probably made your mummy scene. Aye, this is... is just a big quarry. I'd never have found it because when we were here, it was, as you say, all sand. Yeah. Big sand bank, everything like that. The big but difference. Still remember the days it was done. Yeah. It was a kind of special effects scene. Uh, it was the first one I was involved in, where the um, the mummy's hand of the title was coming up through the coming up through the desert in a in a, in a very frightening manner. That bit across there, I remember there digging my own grave and lying down, and then all the action took place for there, and it brings back brilliant memories. Yeah. I oh, didn't I get my corns done that day? <laughs> and it's really strongly evocative of the hand in the Boris Karlov mummy where it goes across the papers. Full credit to the performer here. You knew what was going to happen, you got covered up, and you could hear everything going round about you. The expectations of your saying to yourself, I hope this comes out because in your head it was great. It was just the way he portrayed the mummy. It, we couldn't have believed he was doing it. This man's never acted before. What is he doing? He was a star. He takes on that Boris Karlov heaviness, that slowness, because he has to portray the sense of the undead. That's how the mummy walks. <laughs> That's again the classic Rab Harvey shot where the, the mummy walks into the camera and then away from it. Look at this. Look at that. Wow. Oh, here he comes back. Oh, no. Oh, no. Was that real fire? Yes, that was a real fire. And was that a real mummy? Well, you tell me. What yes. do you think? A real mummy? Oh. There's its arm. How about that, eh? The end. So at the end of the film, we're seeing something that looks a little bit like an outtake, but then the camera pans to the left, across the, pa the cast and crew and some children. Yeah, there's the people that were in the film. That's Joe Keegan. Joe Keegan, is it? Aye. Aye, he filmed. There's. Is it George Burton? And there's me. And my dad sticking his tongue out. And Ian. Wait. Look, oh, you'll see who's under there. Eh? Who's that? I don't know. You? <laughs> Get on, Bob! What are you doing? Fine! <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. So what do you think of that then? No, it was all pretending. That was a film. Such scenes are all too common in Scotland today. But this particular scene isn't being played out in one of our traditional industrial black spots. On the contrary, only a few years ago, Falkirk was designated an area with enormous potential. But the great hopes for the aluminium industry soon began to fade. The company blame lack of demand and heavy losses. The news comes as a serious blow to the Falkirk area, where the unemployment rate could now reach nearly 20%. The work slowly declined. Um, it didn't just close overnight, and so People in the area kind of got used to the idea that there were fewer and fewer people working um, at the works. Even so, when the news of the final closure was announced, it came as a shock uh, to the local community. The BA plant was closing. There was talk of redundancies, and there was a, a really good talk of redundancies, so I decided to take it. And I went and left. <laughs> five of them all together left in, in a, a batch out of the group. When you take that five out of the group, and uh, that was it. It kind of died a natural death after that. It really, it really did like. And uh, really, there's nothing uh, here to replace it at the moment. Um, we have a pride in our heritage, um, and that's why I work for the museum service here. Uh, but um, we, we, we are also trying to look towards the future. We don't know what's going to replace it at the moment. It does take you back sitting here, Royce. Just when you think, starting from just over there, would the paint line, the finishing department, and the warehouse. And but yet, look at it now. Nothing. Trees. It, it, it's sad. It's sad when you when we think of it, but. It's not alone. Every town and every city in the land, big factories have been levelled and small <coughs> things have been put in their place. You know, and when you think of how many folk were employed in that, the amount of metal that was done there. Somebody in an office someplace went chop. And that's what happens when you go chop. It dies, and that place has died. Absolute, totally died. Shocking. Come, bonny lass, lie near me and let the brandy cheer. I'm so excited to be here. I think they, they showed them in town halls and in their workplace and stuff, but I don't think they ever showed them in an actual cinema. And so they're going to see their films presented on a really brilliant, proper cinema screen with the best sound that there is possible, with the lighting just right, and with an audience around them. At the Tristan Fair in Falkirk. Well, I'm Callum uh, Campbell from Falkirk, and I suppose the BA Cowboys had such a big connection with Falkirk, and my granddad was one of them, and your dad. I can't wait to see it. I've never really seen them, so I think I'll be a great mess. I think it's a, a brilliant thing. For me, seeing a lot of it would be like seeing it for the first time. It's going to be quite a revelation to see it on the screen. It's going to be really lovely for them. To go into a cinema and say, that's me up there, you know, it makes you feel good. Everyone's hair will be standing up on the back of their necks. At the Tristan Fair and Falkirk. Oh, 
and Ian Sharp as well. I'm looking forward to seeing the film today. Yes. yes. Before we see the films, we're going to hear a few words from one of the BA Cowboys himself, uh, Alex Penman. Please put your hands together. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look, he's got a speech. We hope you all enjoy the films that we're about to show. You are allowed to laugh and cheer, so please, don't be slow. We're not Audrey Murphy's, not even Big John Wayne's. Making all these films kept most of us quite sane. The next time you see us, it will be on BBC One. I'll have a bow and an arrow, the others will have a gun. <laughs> yeah. One for you. And one for you, Ian. <laughs> That's it. Oh. <laughs> Ian Gardner Danny Griffiths Rocky Young John Young John Queen John Daglish John Duncan Walter Mill John Roberts, Ian Sharp, Peter Shepherd, George Burt, Alex Penman, Dennis McCourt. I'd like to say a special thanks to Rob Harvey, who began it all in the very beginning, and then our cameraman, 
John Aiken, and regrettably neither one is no longer with us. But John Aiken's son is here, and I'm very pleased that him and his good lady wife is here to see it tonight. <laughs> Memories back because I went and saw some of the films getting made. When they made them, I went and saw them up Calendar Park and were meeting them. It was, it was a laugh then as well. Great to see guys again that I haven't seen for years. Uh, and uh, I was amazed at the amount of people that turned up and dressed up as well. Eh? It was really good. It's absolutely brilliant to see that in the big, the big screen. Made it a lot better, made it a lot better for, for people to see. I was so proud, Ray, so, so proud. In fact, at one point, I got really quite emotional. Who could ever have thought that all these years ago when we made home movies, that it would come to this? One, two, one, two, three, four. Goodbye, Joe. Hello, I'm George Butt, and I'm with the films from the BA Cowboys. Fantastic, I've been really looking forward to getting these in. Mm. It's really exciting for us that we're going to be taking these films into our collections at the National Library. We're here to preserve Scotland's memory on film. These were great days and were a way to escape the routine of factory life. Well, looking back on it, it's a part of my life I thoroughly enjoyed. The camaraderie, everybody all just going like that. A pleasurable, happy time in my lifespan. I think it was, I got a lot of pleasure from it. It was away from the ordinary. You know, folk will go through life and I saw them playing at darts or playing snooker. But to go through and say, well, I made films, it gives you a great feeling. And it's different. It's something different you can say you've done with your life. It was one of the classic examples of working class people educating themselves and building their cultural capital, definitely. The testament of how much effort and time went into these films to get them to that length and to get them to that quality, it's just, most people these days would just give up. Oh, dear me, it was great fun. I'll do it again. Right, we just can't stand here all day. What are we going to do then? If Rob was here, he would see the hero survived. So who's the hero then? I'm the hero. I'm the hero. Boys, we are BA Cowboys. I think we're all heroes. <laughs>